The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Change our home life. Change the way we educate our children. It is the presence of God He promised to leave. I will not leave you orphans. Dear brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is with you. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host on The Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and this Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our topic today is one that generates um, a lot of concern, a, a lot of pain, and a lot of intense conversation. And that's the question of infertility. And the title of today's episode is Catholics and Infertility, What's Right and What's Wrong. Now, I've taught medical ethics for a number of years, but I'm not a medical doctor, and I know to defer to people who are experts and smarter than me. And so we have on the line Dr. Ann Nolte, who is the co-founder of the Gianna Center in New York City, which is the only fertility clinic in Manhattan. Dr. Nolte, welcome to The Catholic Current. Thank you, Father. You know, Dr. Nolte, uh, I'm sure that you, you see that uh, uh, infertility is, is a, a, a sadly common occurrence, and there is little that can be more painful in the life of, of a couple than infertility. And that's when some people say to me, isn't it wonderful, Father, that science can intervene, and we have so many options that we didn't have before. We have in vitro fertilization, and we have artificial insemination, and uh, we have surrogacy. Dr. Nolte, are we living in a golden age of infertility treatment? You know, I, I think that uh, people can have that impression because of what they see on the covers of magazines, actresses having babies when they're 50, but the reality that is behind those stories is not quite as golden as what it seems. Um, all of the things that you listed have some pretty significant risks real risks for both the women and the babies that are conceived that uh, people are often not aware of until they're well down the path of entering into into those treatment options. Could you describe what, what some of the, the risks are that, that are associated with, well, let's group them all together as, uh, we'll call it assisted fertility for now. Uh, what, what are sure. some of the risks that are involved? Sure. So they call it assisted reproductive technologies, ART, right. um, and that that largely refers to the the, the three things that you mentioned: uh, intrauterine insemination, uh, whereby a man gives a, a semen sample, typically through an act of masturbation. The semen is then placed inside of the woman's body in the hopes that moving the sperm closer to the egg will increase the chances of conception. Um, that doesn't have so many risks associated with it, but it doesn't really do that much. Typically, in, in uh, couples who are being treated with intrauterine insemination or IUI, um, they still have an underlying reason that they weren't conceiving through natural intercourse, and IUI does nothing to correct that problem. So, so, so that, that approach... their treatment. Right. So that approach uh, masks... Uh, the the illness masks the difficulty and, and treats it treats only the symptom. Correct. It completely okay. skips over the underlying problem, without actually increasing the effectiveness compared to natural intercourse. Um, okay. The the next intervention uh, in vitro fertilization. Uh, many people aren't aware of what that is, but essentially, a woman the woman. 
uh, is typically given very strong hormones to completely shut down her natural uh, fertility cycle. Then she's given other hormones um, intended to overstimulate her ovaries, to get her body to produce many eggs instead of the one or two that would be produced in a natural cycle. In the middle of that cycle, uh, the doctor will use a needle to remove the eggs from her body, and then they're put into a dish uh, with the sperm, again, given by the man separately, typically through an act of masturbation. When the egg and the sperm combine in the dish, the embryos begin to grow, and after several days, the doctors will take a look at the embryos that are there, discarding the ones that they don't like, that are growing but not as well. Now, when you say discarding, we're we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, if, you know, physically, we're talking about fully developed human, human beings. I, I mean, I mean, genetically, they're 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 human beings. When so, when you say dis- discard, you, we're talking about treating human beings as 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 trash, as leftovers, as medical waste. Correct. So these are embryos, okay. sperm and egg have combined, um, mm-hmm. have begun to grow. If they had come together in the correct environment. They um, could grow to childhood, adulthood, and beyond, but uh, based on their characteristics, some are just simply, uh, truly just discarded. Some Mm -hmm. of them are frozen, and Mm -hmm. at this point, there are about 500,000 frozen embryos in the United States created by the IVF process. Couples, as you said, recognize these as their children. They right. can't bring their, themselves to destroy them, thankfully, but right. it leaves them in this state of, of suspended animation. Right, and, and, and of course, handful- it, very many of those are are abandoned uh, as well. The the parents just disappear, and you know we're going. It's a very difficult uh, moral problem. What to do? Uh, with, with those children, but it, it seems to me a lot of what we're talking about, Doctor Nolte, is we're, we're referring to children as if they're objects of quality control. You know, objects we're only going to take control. the and good a, ones. Yeah, they're treated. They're not treated as persons to be right. reverenced and respected. They're treated as something that was manufactured, possessed, right. and owned. And we don't. We don't. We don't treat persons that way, except when they don't look like persons because they're at the embryonic stage. Right, so 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 that that embryonic person is not treated as a patient then? Correct, not at all treated as a patient. Right. Um, In some cases, they'll do genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Um, In genetic testing, this is actually particularly troubling if you really think about it, they remove a single cell from the growing Mm -hmm. embryo so that they can test the genetics. And of course, if there's a genetic problem, that's a reason to destroy the embryo. Mm -hmm. But what people don't realize is the testing itself removes a cell at a stage where that cell actually could grow into a second human person, essentially an identical twin of the first. And so they're essentially creating a twin to destroy it for the sake of testing. You see, as as a philosopher, I, I find that uh, appalling. This is utilitarianism at its worst. We're we're treating some people as merely useful, and then as discardable and as expendable. You know, I always taught my students in, in medical ethics we're only as safe as the most vulnerable member of our society, and it seems to be open season on on human beings at the embryonic stage. Just this is uh, this is very disturbing. Very disturbing and um, and and uh, very disturbing in and of itself, but also disturbing that couples are not really made aware of this. You know, it's presented as, oh yes, we will be able to choose the the best uh, you know pre person that's going right. to give you the best chance of having a baby. They're right. not. They really are not helped to understand exactly what's happening. But when you explain to them in simple terms. The egg and the sperm will come together. Most people believe that's when the life of their baby begins. Right. And so they recognize what destroying it means. But this very veiled language is used to talk about it. The couple right. feel very desperate, and they find themselves sure. going down this path. Right. And, um, and they're, they're um, emotionally exploited by unscrupulous doctors who have a real financial incentive to sell the, their product. Let, let's add another layer of complication and, and talk about surrogacy. So far we're talking about 
uh, you know, say a married couple and, you know, and their own gametes and, and so on. But I, I know that, you know, you, you can get on the phone and order a child to your specification, like you're, you're ordering a takeout meal from Uber Eats. Um, well, what, yeah, what happens? I've seen that, but it's, it wouldn't surprise me if that, that is true. Right. Right, uh, uh, but but again, it, it's it's treating the child as a, as a product. You know, um, when I first started teaching medical ethics, we were looking at a, a documentary, and this was, it was on VHS tape. It was that long ago, and it showed two women who were living together, going through profiles of um, of gamete donors, mm. so that they could pick out. Well, this one's this tall. This one has green eyes. This one plays the guitar. And it was like you're, you're building an automobile from scratch or, or putting together wallpaper and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, or I, I can tell you for gender. Yes. You know, oh, my goodness. That's, that's gender, a whole other topic. absolutely right? happens. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I know for sure that this is a bad philosophy and bad theology, and I know that you can tell us uh, that this is bad medicine. We've got some challenges in front of us. When we come back, we're going to talk more about in vitro fertilization, how it's sold, and what they don't tell you. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Did you know you can listen to the Station of the Cross wherever you go? We're not only available on your radio, but also through your Android and Apple mobile devices. Download our free app today, iCatholic Radio. Pray the rosary with us in just a few quick taps. Listen to our podcasts. View our programming grid and find out what show is coming up next. We provide all of this and more on our free iCatholic Radio app. Tune in today through your Android and Apple mobile devices to hear the solid Catholic programming you love listening to on your radio dial. For more information on iCatholic Radio, please visit thestationofthecross.com. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, St. Paul tells us to pray constantly. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. Also known as the Divine Office or Breviary, the Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. The Office of Readings is also read at 3 p.m. Eastern and helps us to unite in prayer with the Universal Church. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you will join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Station of the Cross. Did you know you can listen to our great Catholic programming even when you're not in range of our station? Visit thestationofthecross.com, then click the Listen Live button on our homepage. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host here at the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is Catholics and infertility. What's right? What's wrong? And our guest is Dr. Ann Nolte, the co-founder of the Gianna Center in New York City, the only Catholic fertility clinic in Manhattan. If you're just joining us, you should know in our first segment, we talked about uh, infertility in general and some of the artificial means that are used to try to overcome infertility. In this segment, we're going to talk about one of the more popular forms of uh, treatment of infertility, and that's in vitro 
vitro fertilization. Uh, Dr. Nolte, you know, the saying goes, the, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. I've seen the very glossy brochures of smiling couples holding their adorable, precious child. Um, and there's a, But there's a lot of fine print that uh, couples are not told about. Can you talk about what some of the fine print, some of the risks and, and, and dangers are in this procedure? Sure, absolutely. So in addition to what we were already talking about with the destruction of of embryonic life, um, people are not aware that the infants conceived through in vitro are placed at significant risk by virtue of having been conceived that way. So um, estimates uh, are published uh, annually, but Mm -hmm. 30 to 40 percent of the babies that are conceived through in vitro will be born prematurely, and premature birth is associated with health complications really potentially in every organ system, especially Mm -hmm. brain, eye, and lung development. Mm -hmm. Babies conceived Mm -hmm. through in vitro are twice as likely to have a major birth defect as babies Mm -hmm. conceived naturally. They're twice as likely to develop cancer in childhood. And Mm -hmm. so it really, um, the process itself um, many times actually is is not effective. Uh, When you look at actual effectiveness rates, they're really quite stunningly low when you look at a per cycle basis. But then even when couples do conceive, there's very real risk for the infant that's conceived. I'll never forget actually a a dear um, colleague of mine who was a nurse in the neonatal ICU. So they take care of the preemie, preemie babies when they're born. She said, we can always tell when one of the premature babies was an IVF baby because they're just oh, really? weaker, they're just more fragile, and they struggle. And yeah. um, the same sentiment was echoed by a NICU nurse in a completely different city at a completely different time, both times completely unprompted. Now, NICU, that's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit? Is that correct? Correct, exactly. Okay, that's where infants go when they are born prematurely or have sure. complications right after okay. birth. Special we are talking with Dr. Ann Nolte of the Gianna Center, the only Catholic uh, fertility center in Manhattan. We want you to be part of the conversation. Call us now at one 511 5483 or text us at the same number at one 511 5483 Dr. Nolte, can you talk about the, the, the success rate of in vitro fertilization? Isn't it sometimes referred to as kind of a, a low-yield uh, pr- procedure, one that's physically costly, financially and emotionally costly, but doesn't, even if there weren't any moral complications, it doesn't often bring about the desired results. Is that correct? Right, absolutely. So um, especially depending on the age of the woman, so the the best chances would be in couples who are in their 20s or early 30s. Um, But Mm -hmm. those couples also would have the best chances of conceiving naturally if they don't do in vitro and just uh, approached it from a corrective uh, corrective approach. Um, But best case scenario, uh, in a given individual cycle of in vitro in these very young, very healthy couples, Mm-hmm. you know, probably gets into a 40 to 50% chance. Um, by, thir- by the time the woman is age 35, and the majority of infertile couples at this point are women 35 and older, that success rate drops to about 25 to 30% per cycle. And by age 40, the chances of conceiving in a cycle of in vitro are only about 10 to 12%. The oh. New England Journal published a study that said the average fertility couple would need to do six to seven cycles of in vitro to get to a 60 to 70% overall chance of having a baby. And the national average cost for a single cycle of in vitro for fertilization, um, not including the cost of medicines, is $12,400. And and that's per per round per cycle per cycle per, per cycle. cycle and and then and then the medicine is is it do you have a ballpark figure on what, on what the medicine associated with would cost um, typically several hundred to several thousand dollars so a single okay. dose of the medicine will often cost one hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. And, and isn't there a, a risk to the woman too? You know, she's being super ovulated to harvest her eggs. Are, are there any inherent risks in that? Sure. I think the biggest risk is is the risk of something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, mm-hmm. Every almost every cycle of in vitro uh, involves deliberate hyperstimulation, but right. in the syndrome. Uh, women can have such a number of eggs developed that it begins to cause fluid shifts. 
and then can uh-huh. second lead to heart failure. And the risk oh. of that becomes very high if she conceives in the cycle in which it happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a low percentage chance of happening, but a very real risk because of how the because of how the body is being treated. Right. And, and, and through that all, as the, I was going to say, as the doctor is marketing, one doesn't like to use the phrase doctor and marketing in, in the same sentence, but, but here we are. Uh, when, when this procedure is, is being marketing, is there very much inquiry as to why there's a problem with fertility in the first place? Sure. You know, it's very interesting you ask that specific question, because when we first opened in New York nine years ago, we looked at all of the the websites of the 18 IVF clinics in the city, and one of the websites actually um, used as their marketing line, we don't have to find the problem because we just bypass it. But then you look at the abominable statistics. So Mm -hmm. what I have seen in our approach where we focus on identifying the underlying cause and then trying to correct it, I'd say at least half of the couples that come to us who have previously been to an IVF clinic have been Mm -hmm. told you have infertility of unknown cause. In In the past nine years, we've probably had five patients out of hundreds that we really couldn't find a cause. Hmm. So it's not not that the diagnosis is correct, it's that the fertility clinic didn't take the time to look um, deeply enough because they move so quickly into this very cookie cutter approach. First, we do some very minimal testing. It's all going to come back normal. Then we do IUI for a couple of cycles with escalating doses of medicine. If you don't get pregnant, then you do IVF. Mm -hmm. If you don't get pregnant, then you borrow someone else's egg and try to get Mm. pregnant that way. It's just... There's very little effort made to find out why a couple's not conceiving, but infertility well, the, is a symptom of right, something. Right. What's the emotional toll on going through this kind of experience of, you know, uh, the invasive tests, the, the, the dashed hopes, the, the financial strain? I'm, I'm sure you've encountered people who, who've, uh, who've been through that. What is it like for them emotionally and in terms of the relationship as a couple? Sure. Well, as you said at the beginning of the program, infertility is really one of the most painful things that mm-hmm. I have seen couples have to go through. I mean, there there are not many things short of losing a child that causes the kind of devastation as just mm-hmm. even being given the diagnosis of infertility. Couples mm-hmm. are shocked. They always believed right. it would be easy. Mm -hmm. And they're devastated. So when they go into the fertility clinic, they go really uh, uh, in a sense of panic. Right. And and in that way, are very vulnerable. So when the doctor is telling them, your only hope is to do this, they start down this path. Right. And it is. It becomes about manufacturing the child. The child no longer becomes the fruit of a couple's love. Right. It becomes the fruit of their labor. Right. And um, I think the IVF process definitely heightens that. That is a risk no matter what approach is used for infertility. I see that in my own couples. And when we're working with couples, one of the things we constantly come back to with them is the child is not the fruit of your labor. They're the fruit right. of your love. And your love well, needs to be a priority in this process, maintaining the love of your relationship. Right, because the quality of the relationship as a couple will affect the, the their ability to uh, to parent well uh, later on. You know, when you mentioned and that, and even uh, to conceive. Well, sure, sure. Well, well, that too. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned that. Um, you know, people are sometimes shocked to discover that that they have uh, fertility problems, and you know, one of the reasons may, may be because when I teach medical ethics, we talk a lot about about STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's a woman who's infected with uh, uh, something where there's not a lot of symptoms. She goes to conceive and, and she can't, and then she discovers that she's got all the scar tissue uh, throughout her reproductive mm-hmm. system. She's had pelvic inflammatory disease. So could we say that? Uh, the culture of promiscuity, which is promoted so blithely and so casually, can later on put people into a desperate situation in terms of their ability to have children. Absolutely. There's, there are, uh, are definitely um, just a group of patients who, that's their exact experience, women who have had pelvic inflammatory disease secondary to a sexually transmitted infection have about a 20% chance of having infertility down the road. And depending on how extensive the damage is, 
um, with mm-hmm. NAPRO, with the approach we take, many times some of that damage can be repaired. Um, many times it cannot. Right. Right. So the, um, there, there is no such thing as, uh, as sex uh, without consequence. Friends, we want you to be part of the conversation here on The Catholic Current. We want you to call us at one 511 5483 or text us at the same number at one 511 5483 uh, You know, the uh, doctor, the the side effects and the processes that you've discovered seem more like a, an... an uh, uh, not so much as a love story, but a, but a, but a nightmare. Um, why do people undergo? Why, why do they? Why do they agree to go through this? Sure. Well, it, it's like I said. I when I came to New York and I started seeing patients here, many of them had been to the fertility clinic previously, and the story that they tell. Um, it's just the same over and over and over again. They went in, they felt desperate. A doctor in a white coat told them, your only hope is to do what I'm telling you. And mm-hmm. as lay people, not knowing that there are alternatives, even Catholics just not knowing this wasn't okay, you know, they thought, oh, it's a baby. The church wants us right. to have babies. Right. Never entered their mind that this wouldn't be okay. They feel like they have no choice. They start down right. this path. And then they find they feel like they're in some kind of a like the twilight zone. Like they've gone right. down the rabbit hole. They don't know how they right. got there. They don't know how to get out. And then, you know, they um, sometimes have the courage to leave it. And sometimes that desperation keeps them in it. But you know, for cycle, sure, after cycle, sure, after cycle. Uh, and and that can take a toll on on their physical and emotional health, their spiritual health, their relational health. Dr. Nolte, we just got a a text message from uh, an anonymous listener who writes, uh, Does God create the life of a child who is conceived through in vitro fertilization? If so, it would seem that so long as the semen and eggs are both from the married couple, this shouldn't be a big issue. I'll address this as a philosopher and a theologian, and then I ask you to to, to round that out with uh, the the medical approach. The, the no matter how a child is conceived, the child is a creation of God and is a member of the human community, as valuable, precious, and unique. As anyone else, so we're not talking about the child being unwelcome in the world. The in vitro fertilization process, though, does treat some children as unwelcome. The ones who are considered too many, excess to demand, so to speak. Those who are genetically not up to snuff. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, in vitro fertilization is wrong. On a theological level, a child has the right to be born through the marital embrace and the marital love of, of the couple. If a couple has had a child through IVF, do they love the child? Yes, absolutely. But the means that they used are, are uh, is morally wrong. Now, regarding conscience, maybe they never had their conscience properly formed. Uh, and, you know, we, we leave that all up to God, but from a philosophical point of view, uh, I know that IVF is a very dangerous um, procedure because it reduces the value of human life, treating children as objects of desire, as products of will, rather than invoking the gift of life from God. Uh, Theologically, it violates the marital embrace because a woman should be made pregnant by her husband and not by uh, a lab technician. We're going to take a break. When when we come back, we're going to look at healthy alternatives to the regime of uh, artificial reproductive technologies. Stay with us. We'll be right back. There's no better way to start your morning than with spiritual formation from a reliable source. That's why the Station of the Cross invites you to listen to Sermons for Everyday Living, Monday through Friday from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Tune in to hear real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Allow these servants of God to preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. They cover everything from the sacraments and Catholic tradition to contemporary issues and distractions from the truth. 
For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. We hope you'll take advantage of this incredible resource and tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time for Sermons for Everyday Living. This Divine Mercy Reflection is from the Diary of St. Maria Faustina. The saints know, love, and serve God and long to be with Him in heaven. St. Faustina expresses this in paragraph 1539. Today I said to the Lord, When will you take me to yourself? I have been feeling so ill and I have been waiting for your coming with such longing. Jesus answered her, Be always ready. I will not leave you in this exile for long. My holy will must be fulfilled in you. St. Faustina responded, O Lord, if your holy will has not yet been entirely fulfilled in me, here I am ready for everything that you want, O Lord. St. Faustina expresses her desire to be with Jesus in heaven, but also knows that she must first fulfill God's will. Do we long to be with Jesus and concern ourselves with fulfilling his will, or do we remain preoccupied with things of the world? This Divine Mercy Reflection is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host on the Catholic Current, where we plug into the the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is Catholics in Infertility, What's Right, What's Wrong. Our guest is Dr. Ann Nolte, co-founder of the Gianna Center in New York City, the, f- the only Catholic fertility clinic in Manhattan. If you're just joining us, you should know that in the first segment, we looked at the problem of infertility in general. In the second segment, we looked at the risks and dangers uh, associated with artificial means, especially with in vitro fertilization. Dr. Nolte, let's, uh, let's take off this next segment. Let's kick it off on, on a positive note. What's the good news? What treatment options are available for an infertile couple that are not only morally sound, but also can be um, uh, medically sound as well. Well, Father, this is one of the wonderful examples of where the Catholic Church's wisdom and its, its clear teaching on these ethical principles led to the discovery of a new approach to women's health that has given us a true alternative to assisted reproductive technologies for couples with infertility. Um, So Catholic doctors for the past 40 years looking for alternatives have really focused on um, what really all doctors should be doing, which is identifying the underlying reasons why a couple is not conceiving and then using that information to use treatments to correct the problem, restore health and normal function, and allow couples to conceive naturally. And what would those include, uh, so some, of, happens, some of the, those treatment options? Yeah, so, so what we found, actually, many decades ago, as doctors were trying to perfect a natural family planning method, so a a means of avoiding pregnancy by teaching women to pay attention to the biomarkers of their cycle. You know, there are Mm -hmm. certain things that a woman detects in her body at different times of the month that serve as an indicator of what's happening normally and abnormally. And so um, in teaching the women about these markers, in creating a system of recording those markers, a charting system called the Creighton Model System, Mm -hmm. the doctors began to see that in the woman's fertility chart, there were abnormal patterns that showed up that indicated underlying hormonal problems, anatomic problems, problems of ovulation. The fertility care chart then became one of the diagnostic tools that we can use to do a much more in-depth evaluation of the woman's hormones, 
of the way she ovulates. People think, you know, ovulation is when the woman's body releases an egg. There are Mm -hmm. many ways that that can go wrong that we have treatments for. Endometriosis is a, a condition in which women have really severe pain when they have their menstrual period, but it mm-hmm. also is a major contributing factor to infertility. And if you mm-hmm. take the time to treat endometriosis by surgically removing it, pregnancy rates go up by, uh, by almost 70%. So it, it's not so much a technique. We think of IVF and IUI as techniques. Mm-hmm. It's more about being a really thorough detective getting to the bottom of all of the things that are keeping the couple from conceiving and then using the tools that we have to restore health and normal function. Well, well, taking the time that that you've you've described, doesn't that cut into your bottom line? Uh, I mean, if your business model is treat them and street them, then getting them on the the IVF hamster wheel, so to speak, seems to be the easy way out. Um, How much time does it take to interview patients, run the test, do the procedures, um, is is it financially viable for a Catholic doctor who wants to do the right thing to actually do the right thing? Sure. I think it, this is one of the unfortunate major disincentives for this approach. You know, you ask, why wouldn't all doctors do this? Why wouldn't all doctors take the time uh, it's to certainly find better the problem medicine. and correct it? It's better medicine. It's what we do in every other area of health care except women's health. But there's this tremendous payoff to do this quick, simple procedure that takes only a matter of minutes, you know, $12,000 for one month versus the approach that we take requires educating the woman, becoming a part, you know, helping her to become a true partner in her care. And with the way health insurance reimburses doctors, spending time with patients is really poorly reimbursed. Um, As a result of that, for us, we created a foundation to fundraise so that we could continue to provide high quality care to patients, but but it is not lucrative, and, and we do uh, seek outside support so we can continue to provide them with excellent care. It's ironic that treating human beings with the dignity that God gave them uh, is, isn't rewarded by the culture that we live in. Friends, we want you to be part of the conversation. We want you to call us right now at one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. 511 or text us at the same number, one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. 511 Dr. Nolte, so far we've been talking primarily about women and infertility. We just got a text message from Maria in Ohio asking what can be done for a man who has an insufficient sperm count. Uh, do you work mostly with women, or do you have any uh, advice or recommendations for, for men who are struggling with infertility? Sure. We approach it the same way. So, again infertility is a symptom of something and that can be something on the woman's side the man's side or both and it's about Mm -hmm. evenly divided 30 percent of each so on the man's side just like women can have hormonal issues men can as well just like anatomically something could be wrong in the woman's body that is keeping her from conceiving men can have something anatomic something called a varicocele is a prominent vein that can can push the sperm counts down. Um, So many NAPRO-trained doctors like myself do a very in-depth evaluation on the man's side as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate in New York City uh, personally because there are several um, physicians who are not in our practice but who are are very committed to getting to the bottom of correcting male factor fertility. And if you take the time to find those doctors, um, in many cases a lot can be done. There's also a lot of misconceptions about what is possible when it comes to uh, the man, the man's fertility, you know, we have seen natural conception through natural intercourse without intrauterine insemination in couples in which the husband's sperm count was as low as 1 million per ml and normal fertility would be considered 15 to 20 million per ml. Hmm. So, um, you know, it's treated as unthinkable, but the reality is when you focus on trying to optimize health, right. Many times natural conception is still possible. That's right, because you're trying to optimize health rather than trying to, to optimize uh, uh, profit. On, on average, you know, the work that you do with, with NAPRO technology, the approach that you take, what's your success rate in, in helping married couples achieve pregnancy? Very good question. Um, very much dependent on age, the age of the mm-hmm. couple, and also um, just the underlying problems. So just to give you a frame of reference, many people aren't aware of the natural decline of fertility that happens with age, regardless of infertility. So at 35, 
um, 90% of women are still able to have a baby. By 35, Mm -hmm. about 10% no longer can. At Mm -hmm. 40, about 70% of women are fertile. And Mm -hmm. 30% of women have reached an age where they can no longer have children. And at 45, only about 10 to 15 percent of women can still have a baby. So when we're treating women under the age of 40, um, I would say our overall success rates, all comers, probably fall in the 60 to 70 percent range. Um, As we get to couples over 40, you know, the early 40s, 40, 41, 42, probably in the 30 to 50 percent range. And Mm -hmm. then older Mm -hmm. than that, we still work with them to optimize their health, but we also set just a realistic expectation for what the body is capable of. Of. Right, right. You know, so far we've been talking um, more about some of the, the medical aspects of, of assisted f- fertility. We haven't been talking very much about the social uh, aspects. You know, uh, you know, young women are often uh, encouraged, especially if they go to Ivy League schools and they're a certain height and, and eye color, to, to become uh, egg donors. Um, you know, men are invited to, to become sperm donors. Uh, and so there are people uh, who have, if you will, spread their gametes around uh, without any awareness of what that means long term. We, we got um, a response to one of our surveys this morning from an anonymous uh, reader, excuse me, anonymous listener. And she writes, I found out I was a grandmother to a two-year-old donor on Ancestry DNA. My son, I was shocked to learn, was a sperm donor. Uh, while in college. She goes on to say, I am not a psychologist, so I don't know why it's been so painful emotionally and mentally, but the loss of not knowing my grandchildren is very difficult. But it's the last sentence that really stands out for me because she writes, uh, immediate family should be contained, not scattered carelessly because biological truth matters. I, 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 was, I was very moved. Uh, by that. Um, you know, there's a, a foundation, Dr. Nolte, I believe called Good Eggs that encourages women to become egg donors. As a medical doctor, what would you say to them? I would say the same thing as I've said before. There's mm-hmm. a risk associated with the woman going through the process that leads to harvesting the eggs. And so you, when you're a couple, you desperately want a baby. Now you're asking another person to make their body a commodity in addition right. to creating the child and right. treating it as a commodity. It's below the dignity of the person. Um, right. And the child conceived is at all of the same risks as children conceived through in vitro, through couples that are together. The other thing I would say is in couples in which they use an egg donor, the knowledge that the child is biologically the husband's, but not mm-hmm. the wife's, mm-hmm. remains with the couple for their entire life. They may still love the child, the child may still be precious, but that knowledge remains there like an elephant in the room throughout. Right. And the same was with the opposite, when it is uh, somebody else's sperm. You know, essentially your spouse has created a child with another person. That's the reality of what has yes, happened. Yes, yes, and, and how painful and, and difficult that is. When we come back on our next segment, we're going to talk about resources, recommendations, and how to treat, teach your doctor to treat you better. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi. I'm Dr. Rick Fitzgibbons from the Institute for Marital Healing. Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marital friendship and love? Your marriage can be transformed by learning how to overcome some of the basic pitfalls that can damage marital hope and joy. So what are some of the weaknesses which can be interfering with God's loving plan for your marriage? Based on 30 years of experience with thousands of couples, we've seen how selfishness, excessive anger, and controlling behaviors can build walls between spouses. Other emotional problems which can also be overcome include loneliness, anxiety, weaknesses in confidence, and repeating a conflict of a parent. Another two that are all too common are a lack of positive communication and the failure to appreciate the sacrament of marriage. Visit MaritalHealing.com to evaluate where your marriage stands on these issues and for free, effective advice on resolving conflicts so that your marriage can be what God intends it to be. That's MaritalHealing.com. 
Are Christians guilty of hate speech for voicing their belief that homosexual acts are immoral and contrary to human nature? Many in the culture think so. So what can we say in response? First, it's not hate speech to say a particular behavior is inappropriate human behavior, given our nature as human beings. If that were true, well then any negative moral evaluation of behavior would be hate speech. But that's absurd. Second, the assertion is inconsistent with itself. Why can't Christians have a negative moral evaluation of homosexual behavior, but yet the objector can negatively judge a Christian's behavior for opposing homosexuality? Isn't he guilty of the very thing he accuses Christians of? My friends, it's not hate speech to say a particular behavior is not befitting of human beings. We must judge actions, but always with respect for the person. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1 877 511 5483. Shortly after today's show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. Here you'll find a link to Father McTague's recommended reading list and a link for downloading the program so that you can share it with your family and friends. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host on the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. We want you to be part of the conversation we're having about Catholics and infertility, what's right and what's wrong. Call us now at 1-877-511-5483. Or text us at the same number, one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. If you're just joining us, you should know that in our first segment, I spoke with Dr. Ann Nolte, co-founder of the Gianna Center in Manhattan, uh, regarding infertility in general. In the second segment, we looked at problems associated with artificial reproductive technologies, in particular in vitro fertilization. In the third segment, we looked at some healthy choices that people can make that can bring about desired results and keep both body and soul intact. In this segment, we're going to look at how to teach your doctors to treat you better. Uh, we have a caller on the line, Dr. Nolte, from John of Cape Cod. Uh, John, w- welcome to the Catholic Current. What do you have to say to us today? Hi, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, this subject's very near and dear to my heart. I actually have male factor in fertility myself. My wife has been. My wife and I have been trying to build a family for, for a few years now and successfully, so... Uh, thank you for putting this on the radio. And uh, sure. really, we've been able to resist the sort of pressure to, to go through IVF because of some really wonderful faith counseling that we received from a good priest. Um, otherwise, I'm sure we would have fallen into the same trap. Uh, right. So this is our discussion. And really, my question is to the doctor. How do you recommend we locate an APRO trained physician? And then what would we be looking at in sort of the timeline in, in terms of getting into treatment? and the type of test that might need to be performed to, uh, you know, hopefully help us with our goal. Sure, thank you. So there are two places you can look. Um, One is fertilitycare.org. That is the website of um, the Creighton Model and NAPRO Technology, where you can find both Creighton teachers to teach the charting, as well as uh, they maintain a list of NAPRO doctors around the country. Our website, um, Gianna... NationalGianaCenter.org maintains a list of affiliate doctors. Um, all of our uh, affiliate medical centers, there are nine uh, Gianna centers, uh, most of them in the Northeast. They are, um, you can find them on that website. Where did you say that you're from? Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah, I believe New Hampshire may be your closest. You might want to look for a Dr. Sarah Baskell, B-A-S-C-L-E. Um, and then the typical process is an initial visit where the doctor will get to know your entire medical history. Um, if you've already started, if your wife's already started charting with the Creighton model, you'll be about two months ahead of the game. Um, once the, okay. the person has learned to chart, we will do one month of very intensive testing of the woman's cycle, her, her, the hormones of the fertility cycle, the way that she ovulates, um, a test to make sure that her fallopian tubes are open. And typically in that month, we would also test the 
husband's semen analysis, and if there are abnormalities, um, a hormone evaluation and a physical exam. And then treatment should start uh, as soon as that testing cycle is over. The way we approach treatment from a corrective standpoint, uh, once we have a treatment that normalizes what's found on the both sides, we would continue a corrective treatment for up to a year to a year and a half. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to take that long. Many couples conceive in the first month or two or three of treatment, but we're, we're normalizing health and returning a couple to normal fertility. And we know that a couple of normal fertility can take up to a year to get pregnant. So um, the evaluation is is uh, about a month or two months, and then treatment lasts until conception occurs. Okay, that's great information. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, John. You know, I'm aware, doctor, that we're giving lots of information today, and we want our listeners to have it all. So I invite our listeners to go to our website shortly after the show. You can download the entire podcast uh, all well, the audio of, of the show here, uh, the whole conversation that Dr. Nolte and I have had with the listeners, uh, and then there's program notes with a, with a reading list. All the information you need to share the good news uh, is right here. Uh, doctor, we had a text from uh, Joseph who writes, My wife suffers from endometriosis, and the doctors we saw were very insensitive towards our Catholic beliefs. They usually suggested birth control and were done with it. Uh, would Father and Dr. Nolte talk about the social aspect of infertility issues? Dr. Nolte, before you answer that, I, I just want to say that um, what, what you've been saying about infertility isn't some Catholic quirk you have, like you prefer to wear a scapular or you put ashes on your head on Ash Wednesday. This is just good science and good medicine, isn't it? Absolutely. It is because we eschew these other treatments that doctors have really focused on providing the highest quality medical care. And so it really is um, honestly what doctors are doing in every other field of medicine. Um, I, I completely uh, hear what the the um, caller is saying in terms of the social consequences. Um, endometriosis itself, I'd actually like to speak to that first. Sure. As a doctor treating infertility, a woman with infertility is, um, it's an it's a, a incredibly painful condition. It's a tremendous amount of suffering. But from the perspective of what I hope for my patients, when I find a patient that has infer- um, endometriosis, I feel a great sense of hope because um, with a, a good surgeon to remove the endometriosis, the condition can actually be cured. And so the, the physical symptoms, the severe pain and other symptoms that go along with it um, after a well-done surgery can be, um, in many cases, completely alleviated. And it's one of the conditions that when you remove it, pregnancy rates in infertile couples go up by um, almost 70%. So oh it's, it's one of the things that has a tremendous option when it's offered. And it, it is a true shame that doctors really because of this bypass or suppress mentality that exists, they don't give patients this option. And honestly, many surgeons have lost lost the skills to be able to do this surgery well. So um, really would encourage any patient who may have endometriosis to seek out a NAPRO technology trained surgeon um, and talk about their options. But whether it's endometriosis, whether it's wanting to use natural family planning, whether it's not uh, doing in vitro fertilization, I think the experiences of many couples when they go to the doctor actually cause far more pain sometimes even than the underlying condition. And um, I think it, it, I think the couple's faithfulness to their belief in many cases right. is striking a nerve in sure. the doctor that leads to some really bad behavior that even really is in the realm of unprofessional at times. When you say it, it's striking a nerve, why, why is that unsettling for the doctor to, to see people trying to live according to Catholic principles? which incidentally happened well, to be in harmony with good science. Yeah, you know, I this is purely speculative on my part, but you know, mm-hmm. we're human beings. Right. When, um, when we have a strong emotional reaction to something someone says to us, 
It's right. typically because they've struck a nerve. So mm -hmm. a doctor who doesn't have some uh, interior issue over this, when someone says they don't want to do birth control, I don't want to do natural family, I don't want to you know do in vitro. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't. It shouldn't generate uh, hostility, but many times it does. So mm -hmm. part of me wonders if uh, there's just an uneasiness with the approach that's being taken, right? Uh, and and that being challenged is triggering it. You know, I really don't know, but the stories I've heard have been uh, pretty terrible from couples. Well, yes, and you know, uh, couples that I've spoken with, and, and people in the medical professions, and so on, and it, roughly speaking, they say, Father, you know, the, in particular, the oral contraceptives get diplomatic immunity, you know, culturally, scientifically, medically, and any kind of behavior or words that suggests that taking the pill is no more significant than taking Tic Tac uh, somehow has to be uh, smacked down. And, and I've seen that consistently o over the years. There's something ever so special about the pill that you're never allowed to um, raise any questions about it at all. Mm-hmm. That's very true. And, and I, I know doctors who uh, who said that, you know, hey, I, I think you're right, Father, but I'd go out of business, or the people in my practice would, would put me out of business. There's a book called Physicians Healed, and it's a mm -hmm. compendium of conversion stories of doctors who uh, didn't practice the way Dr. Nolte does, and then were, were moved to, to contrition. And not only live their faith uh, better, but they were they were living um, they were living better science. Uh, they were practicing better medicine and using better science as well. You know, doctor, we talked about uh, the the very great pain that's involved in infertility, and I'm sure you've seen that much much more than I have. What advice or consolation or message of hope do you have to couples who are struggling with infertility? You know, I would I would encourage them to look. For one of these NAPRO trained doctors, even if they're not local, you know, we in New York City actually have patients um, from from other states in some cases and can do mm -hmm. um, many things long distance. But these doctors are are highly trained medically to help, but mm -hmm. they're also trained um, spiritually and emotionally to support and walk with them on this journey. Right. And, and what that's God is essential. doing in their life. Right. You need authentic human beings practicing human medicine to help heal uh, the health of uh, other authentic human beings. You've been listening to The Catholic Current. Our guest today has been Dr. Ann Nolte of the Gianna Center in Manhattan. I'm Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus. Before we depart, let me give you a blessing. Through the intercession of Our Lady Mount Carmel, may God bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.